Hello everybody and welcome to tier 8 part 3 of the conspiracy theory iceberg. I am so excited to get to some of this information because like ever since I first looked at the list I wanted to just spend the whole time and I know this I say this with a few of the intros but I wanted to just like get into all the really weird and out there concepts with UFOs and like evolution and of course giants so you know and now we're getting to the point where we get to focus on a lot of that and it just feels so rewarding now we're up to i think like 417 thousand subs and it's it's so weird like uh, i got nostalgic doing this like whenever i started the series i was at like maybe 700 eight and now we're here and so many people have joined on the ride as we've been going and uh i just i really can't thank you all enough so thank you one quick announcement i want to say uh before we get started is I've decided that once this entire series is over, what I'm gonna do is I am going to take the entire iceberg, every single video, cut off all of the intros and outros, and then make it one video. That way, if any of you all, or people later on down the road who find it, wanna listen through it without all of the starts and stops in the playlist, it'll just be one like 11 hour video of everything at once. That way there's less mid rolls, that way it takes up less time, etc. And it's really wild that we're almost to the end of this thing, uh, but I'm having a great time and I'm gonna enjoy it to the end. So thank you all for being here and thank you for watching. I'm sure just like me, you feel like a psychopath at this point for enjoying it, but that's okay, psychopaths are people too. But you know what you don't have to be a psychopath to enjoy? That's right, today's sponsor, Darkfire Heroes. See, Darkfire Heroes is unique from a lot of other mobile games because as a gamer myself, I actually enjoyed playing it. One thing I enjoy about it specifically compared to other arena-based player versus player games is the amount of agency you have while playing it. Like, not only is every single hero unique with their own skill set, different elemental moves, and a roster that lets you fully customize your own team, but things like actually aiming your character special attacks or choosing what attacks they enter the battle to begin with makes it feel like you're really playing a game rather than just watching a game happen. Not only that but all of the settings that I played through were each unique and felt very detailed in the way they bring this world to life and with continuous live events and updates that the game gets every time they add more to the game it feels like attention and care was put into it so not only do you get to fight through a very detailed campaign as well as a player versus player arena where you pit your team against other teams but you also get to participate in these monthly sort of competition events that they have where you can get limited time access to special characters and gear this is all all while building up your own unique roster and truly making the game tailored to however you want to play. Going to the link in the description, I invite you to come play Darkfire Heroes because it really is a fun game and it really is everything they hype it up to be. So thank you all so much for watching through this ad. Thank you to Darkfire Heroes for sponsoring the channel. It means a lot. Uh, I hope that you check it out. It helps me, it helps the channel, and it really means the most. And we are back to the video. We're gonna go ahead and get into it. I'm excited, but as always, Thank you for watching. Aliens caused the bubonic plague is the theory that aliens caused the bubonic plague. The bubonic plague, also known as just the plague or the Black Death, was a disease that swept through mostly Europe but the rest of the world in the 14th century. It's estimated to have killed 25 million people or a third of the world's population. There were several prevailing theories at the time that mostly came from the church that the bubonic plague was either God's punishment for the immorality of the people or that it was a curse brought on to them by the devil or witches. And that witch thing is interesting because there are several theories that things relating to astrology and spells and sorcery are the relation of extraterrestrial beings. So combining some of the ideas we've talked about in the iceberg up until now, you take ideas that aliens create magic or that aliens are just beings in a plane that we can't see. So if you think the bubonic plague was called by sorcery, then that sorcery may not have been of earth. And the motivations for this could be population control, an attempt at total extermination, who knows. Enchanted websites is related to the idea that there is a sort of fake success that is bestowed on some people through the use of magic. While there's a joke somewhere in here about how to fix the algorithm, you pretty much have to get lucky or use black magic to get there. The idea is that certain famous people came to the power that they have through the use of these magical 
enchantments. In research for this, I came across a website called Enchanted Websites that is really, really old and was advertising that they can make you famous by just giving them your website. They kept talking about all their clientele who went on to great success and saying that they can bestow their special capabilities onto whatever you're already using and then you'll get popular. Of course, I tried to see if I could get some magical whatever advice, but all the websites and links were dead, so sad. But it all relates back to that greater theory that some of the success we see in the world of whatever's popular is artificial. Sun collapse is related to the concept of solar farming. Solar farming is exactly what it says, the fact that us as humans continuously farm the energy that's expelled by the sun. The basic idea with this is, is that we're farming it too much. In other words, through using its heat or its light in order to grow agriculture or just solar panels, we are taking away from the equilibrium that once existed. And it all goes back to the whole idea of like energy conservation. And essentially, while the sun's believed to be a burning star, this is saying that the net value of heat that it expels has to be kept at a sort of even level and that we're throwing that too much in the balance will eventually make the sun run out of energy and therefore collapse and then we all die so neat microchips found in fossils is not a joke and there have been fossils that have been opened up and things found that were initially said to be microchips now in every single one of these stories the details of it have been walked back afterwards for example a t-rex bone that had a microchip found in it they later said was a fossil of some ancient bacteria another one they said was just a bone fragment that looked a whole lot like a microchip and kind of related i remember in research reading about stories for previous sections about fuses being found in ancient pots. So for example, they open up this completely undisturbed grave, they're going through all of the pots in there, and then they find what appears to be modern day fuses. This all relates back to a concept called the Great Reset, which I don't know how much in detail I wanna get about it now because I'm pretty sure like the Great Reset itself is mentioned later on, but short version for now, the Great Reset says that we constantly exist on a cycle. We go from the first remnants of humanity to a point where we destroy everything, and then thousands or millions of years later, the whole cycle repeats itself. That would explain things like why the Earth, despite being hundreds of million years old, humanity only has history around 10,000. The idea being we'll all get wiped out, there will be a reset, and then those people that come however many million years from now will find remnants of our existence and then gather them. The reason that T-Rexes had microchips on them and the reason people used to put fuses in jars. That's your basic intro. Um, I'm sure it'll come up later. If not, I'll do a video on about it. Whatever, next topic. The Black Snake Prophecy relates to a legend of the Lakota tribe. Essentially, the Native American tribe of the Lakota had this legend that near the end times, a great black snake would come across the land and destroy everything. The legend says that it will desecrate ritual sites, that it will destroy villages, and that it will come from the ground and then return back to the ground. As many modern Lakota members have pointed out, this is a perfect example of the ideas of oil pipelines, roadways, and other modern industry. The idea being the idea of a great black snake coming and destroying the ritual sites of the Lakota, and now a giant oil pipeline is trying to do the same thing is alarming. But politics aside, this has a greater expanding idea when it comes to prophecy. Things that most people would brush off as being not true, if you can view the black snake as being the modern fulfillment of an old prophecy, then what other old prophecies could also be true? Things I mentioned like the Wetico, a disease that essentially consumes someone with greed, could be the idea of modern corporatism. You could take it on and on and on and say maybe some of those crazy spiritual beliefs weren't so crazy after all. Underground caverns. Oh boy. So every time another hollow earth theory thing comes up, I mention sort of a different facet of it. And one day I'm gonna do a video putting it all together, but there's a few I wanna go over with this one. For example, the Tibetan holy books said that beneath Mount Everest specifically, there were these tunnel systems that went all over the world. Now, if you know anything about cave systems, the majority of them are completely unexplored. Near a cave system that I live by that's a popular tourist attraction, they've tried to drop trackers into riverways to see where they end up, and they will totally disappear 
forever. <laughs> and also the majority of underground systems are closed up by the government and in most cases it is a felony if you destroy or try to get access to them. This leans back into the thing I've kind of hinted at in a lot of theories that the entire world has these underground systems that work towards the bigger concept of hollow earth. And think about it, every single group of people have some form of legend of creatures living underground. Either it be old Chinese tales of frogmen that come from underneath caves or old night stories of these troglodyte creatures that they would fight on their expeditions. Even religions with the common idea that demons live underneath or the idea that you can dig your way down into hell. That combined with the fact that it's believed underneath the pyramids is a massive underground cave system, or the idea that these random structures on Antarctica were constructed a long time ago as a signal to get underground for some reason, and other ancient societies who had a distinct interest with caves, and some of them disappearing altogether at once, it makes you wonder. Biblical aliens is basically the idea that several things that are mentioned in the Bible as rather innocuous concepts are actually about extraterrestrials. Put it this way, there's a ton of mentioning in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, that people will worship the stars and the things in them. Well, if you think about other concepts we've talked about of UFOs and the fact that they've been here for however many thousand years, then it puts together the idea that these people may not just be worshiping the constellations. And some take this to mean several mentions in the Bible of either angels or these great sightings appearing before people are actually aliens being described by prophets. Some go as far as to say biblically accurate angels are actually just what extraterrestrials look like, which is a terrifying concept. Air's poison isn't necessarily saying air is going to kill you, even though technically it kind of does, but that's besides the point. More so, it's saying that air is a drug. For one, oxygen itself is a sort of like hallucinogenic, and if you take 100% oxygen at once, you can pass out or get very lightheaded. The idea being all the trace particles that we breathe in every day from the point that we're born till now create a sort of blurred idea of what reality really is. So that asks the question, if air causes these sort of long-term psycho events, then what does reality really look like and has anyone really seen it? This could also explain why things like the supernatural and spirits aren't visible to us because maybe there's a sort of fog in the way of our viewing. The Luna Park train fire demon which is one heck of an entry title. On June 9th of 1979, the Luna Park Amusement Park had a ride known as the Ghost Train that caught on fire and ended up killing seven people. The story itself was really tragic. Basically, people who were on the ride were killed while within the ride from a very brutal fire. And an investigation that occurred later ruled that the fire was caused by an arson on purpose, although the perpetrator was never caught. Then one day, while a woman who lost her son and her husband to the fire was going through pictures of the park that day, she came across this image. Now, other than being absolutely terrifying, the person in the costume is especially alarming as no one was able to find him after the event there was never a record of them hiring or having a costume like that because, duh, why would a park make that a mascot for kids? And from all points and records, this guy did not work at the park and was just a bystander. So for one, it's really creepy that that guy was there on the day of the fire. And two, it's doubly creepy that presumably the dad or someone took a picture with their kid next to him. What some have pointed out that's especially creepy about this is that the costume bears a striking resemblance to Moloch. Moloch is one of the gods of the Canaanites mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible. Essentially, Moloch is always depicted as the golden bull with horns that the primary form of worship was to burn children at the altar of it, which led to these horrifying statues of golden bulls with fires underneath them and people just throwing babies into it because gotta love that Old Testament stuff. <laughs> now, it's not a secret that several demon or demon-like gods are worshiped in the modern sense, although we don't really hear a lot about what they do. Whereas here, we see someone dressed as Moloch at a park on the day that the child he's taking a picture with was burned alive and you see where I'm going with this. The idea is perhaps this guy as a form of worship to this god burned the children alive as several other children died 
in the train fire. This opens up the idea that some of these evil practices may still be occurring in the modern world. Neanderthal superiority is the idea that the main competitor with Homo sapien, Neanderthal, was actually the superior race. Basically, people who study like the evolution of humanity say that Neanderthal, who was our main competitor, who was possibly interbred with to create us, it's confusing, from the records of their technological capabilities were actually the stronger people. However, yet they still seem to lose. And I mean lose in like the evolution evolutionary sense. I mean, it's not like there was a tug of war game over, although there might have been, that would have been cool. Um, anyway, now where they went, a lot of people say is just from a lack of resources and they died out. Although there's a lot cooler theories later in the list. But for now, I want to mention the one throwaway one that I appreciate is that they eventually evolved into Bigfoot. Um, which is going to be the leading theory from now. So like from this video, a Bigfoot is Neanderthal, although I'm gonna retcon that one later, but that's canon as of this moment. UFOs are atmospheric life forms is actually an idea that was originally brought forward by Robert Fort, a guy I mentioned way back in the iceberg, the Fordian ideas of the supernatural, this was his doing. Basically the idea of these energy beings or beings from a separate dimension is that UFOs aren't carriers from aliens from our plane of existence. Instead, there's other planes of existence and they're crossing over and that's either what they look like or what our brains and like stupid human eyes process them as. Keep in mind, when UFOs were originally spotted, they were described as sky beasts. So that would match up. There's a ton of theories when you go into this from everything that it is an extraterrestrial, but it's simply sort of camouflaging itself to our eyes, to some even saying they are souls in the afterlife, just visible to the human conscious. Conscious, consciousness, consci whatever. I don't know what's more terrifying, the idea that there's like a hundred living things on side of that ship, or the giant ship itself is a living thing. Actually, now that I say it out loud, yeah, that's definitely more terrifying. Expanding Earth is the idea that over time, the Earth is slowly getting bigger. In the modern sense, we can see that with things on the seafloor seemingly being relocated over the course of 100 years. And, you know, when it comes to conservation of mass, if there were things in our atmosphere that are now being harvested and turned into things on Earth, then that is slowly compiling to the overall size of it. This is even used as an explanation for continental drift and the idea of Pangaea. The idea that they didn't break away and then float, they were sort of pushed apart as the earth got bigger. And ideas such as global warming could be quite literally, since we're getting bigger, we're technically getting closer to the sun. Or, you know, there's the alternative theory that it's not because stuff's getting, you know, put on the earth, it's that the earth is expanding from the inside out, which would probably mean that the inside was, I don't know, hollow. <laughs> <laughs> forest stairs is a concept i absolutely love and even did an entire video on which will be linked in the description but short version the forest stairs are these random staircases that seem to be found in remote parts of the forest most stories around them relate to the idea of someone going up to them and either hearing or seeing some sort of spatial anomaly with some cases that happen whenever someone goes to them alone where they either get mutilated or just die. The leading idea with this is that the stairs are sort of leakovers from other dimension, and directly interacting with them is kind of like staring at a glitch in a video game. Whenever you do it, you are therefore inserting yourself into the problem which makes sort of the spatial anomalies interact with you. Everything happens to people who walk on the stairs or touch the railings, from they begin to lose all their hearing and start to hear noises that aren't there, to some where they just get eviscerated all at once, which is fun. Either way, the forest stairs exist in that perfect space of sort of neutral anomalies that exist in the mountains and the wilderness, and I for one absolutely love it. Nephilim protocols. So Nephilim, uh, if you didn't watch my Bible iceberg, is in relation to the concept of John. However, the Nephilim protocols aren't specifically about that. Essentially, there are these hidden files that exist on the deep web, which is a fancy way of saying a Tor browser, yada yada, that over time seem to be collecting data for an unknown reason. All of these files are encrypted, but they're each given a specific encryption key that if a certain event takes place, they will become open. Now, there's a lot of like rabbit holes to shoot down with this, but the short version is that anytime some public scandal comes out, they seem to compile more data. The idea is that these servers, named after giants for a pretty good reason, are compiling a ton of data about elites or 
secret sort of Watergate style events that happen around the world. And then for a reason that no one knows, they will become open and shed light on what the elites are doing. No one knows who's doing it. No one knows what opens them, but ideas range from everything that it is certain high up elitist members who are sort of staging an anti-coup to it being the Illuminati, to some saying that it's quite literally giants themselves, which is my favorite theory and the one I'm going with. I just imagine like a giant like underground in a cave like wearing the morpheus outfit from the matrix with the glasses like on a giant keyboard gathering information about epstein and it just makes me happy atomic renovation is one of two theories i think it's the latter but i'll say both the first one is the idea that the stereotypical american 50s whenever people had the idea of the atomic family was part of a docility program essentially get people to accept this one way of living so that way they don't think about the government around them or the concepts which while there's a case to be made for that i think it's actually referring to the second idea the second idea is that atomic weapons were developed by governments as a means of immediately reclaiming a populace basically think of it like this if the evil lizard government gets together and decides that they can nuke a certain country because the people aren't doing well then they can just nuke it and then they can wait 30 years and then they can go in and just reset it so essentially you renovate whatever group of people you don't like if they're too insubordinate or whatever and atomic weapons are essentially a giant reset button so they weren't developed as an arm race or to better defend a country as we're led to believe basically as a giant system of population control. Since this programming has to do with your individual experience as a human on earth. Basically it's like this, you've heard concepts that your red is not my red, and that everyone smells different smells a certain way or everyone tastes things a different way and all of those senses have slowly been programmed into you over time the interesting thing is we don't really know what does that programming sure people can see different shades of colors differently but it's believed that that is a learned trait rather than a born one. So there are these hidden factors that exist around us that cause us to experience reality in the precise way that we experience it, creating a 100% unique humanity from every person to person. Paradigm recalescence is a sort of expanding idea when it comes to technology of eventually getting to a point above consciousness think of it as like having an out-of-body experience that you can control and interact with other minds the idea behind it is that we're really really close like think of everything technology can accomplish when it comes to medicine and psychology and think if we can find a way to get consciousness out of the human body for a limited amount of time a theory going a bit deeper than that so there is this thing i've seen floating around whenever i talk about these sort of technological concepts on the iceberg called the mariana web essentially it's supposed to be a very deep down part of the internet that is purely data it's supposed to be the hard files on how to make the broder's engine that i talked about it has all the schematics to build a GGG QEP, which is the supercomputer I talked about, and the paradigm recalescence as well. The idea is these are technological things that will push humanity to the next level. And even though we know how to do it, the elites or the powers that be are hiding them from us because either we're not ready or they don't want us to have that power. So essentially somewhere there exists a super internet where we can make the next step in the technological revolution and become these super beings that can project our body and have infinite energy and these forever computers and whatever. Um, so if anyone can find it, I'll give you $5. Neolithic's contraption is closely related to the whole microchips found in dinosaur bones. Basically looking at Neolithic devices or other ancient groups of people and the designs that they built, there's some interesting crossovers. For example, concepts like the aqueduct and even things like wind turbine engines had these sort of basic forms that were created in ancient society that we seem to forget about for a thousand years and then reinvent later. So think about this. You have us now who is making technology and then imagine that there was something like, I don't know, a great reset where all of humanity starts over. So then it continues on that pipeline and then they begin to forget why they know some things and then they're rediscovered. Essentially saying ancient world technologies that seemed quite advanced for their time 
are because of memories or remnants from technologies that existed in the previous generation of people. And I don't mean generation as in like their parents, I mean generation like the next cycle back. So these contraptions that were built thousands and thousands of years ago are due to contraptions that were built millions and millions of years ago. Eratus is something that if you're on this side of YouTube, I'm sure you've heard of before. Now there is an excellent video by Nexpo that I'm gonna link in the description. He covers this in way better detail than I can go into right now, but the short version is this. Basically someone discovered that at UPS there was a word called Eratus that they weren't supposed to ask about and anyone who asked about it got fired. And after doing some digging, the original poster figured out that this exists across several companies and Eratus is essentially this program that compiles information about millions and millions of people and then throws it into assumedly a government database. Of course, this is super illegal, but the idea behind it is that it is a means of general population control by knowing everything about what everyone's doing, etc. Where the creepy part comes in is that anyone who talks about Eratus online either gets shut down or silenced in some way. Now, Nexpo's video staying up after having like 3.6 million views about it kind of kills the fun there. But the idea of it being a super database that brings in information about everyone who seemingly just works normal jobs is still present. Diseases worship is exactly what it says. There are certain groups of society throughout history who have quite literally worshiped diseases. Examples of that would be gods like Sopano from older cultures that was quite literally the god of smallpox. So tie in what I said about the Black Plague earlier and put together this entire idea that if these great diseases that wiped out large portions of humanity were either extraterrestrial or supernatural in some way, Way, then it would make sense for people to worship it which would mean in the historical context they have the same energy of that as a sort of pagan god and depending on how you feel about pagan gods or the ideas of lesser gods existing in the world then it may stand to reason that diseases themselves are sort of expressions or at least punishments from these beings. Because several diseases seem to come out of nowhere, and why we believe that to be mutation, the theory is saying that it is in fact a divine, or I guess you could say anti-divine, whatever the correct word is for like other gods, I don't know. It's supernatural, honky, wonky stuff. Animal-plant hybrids relates to the overall idea of convergent evolution. Essentially, there have been modern microbes found that contain both plant and animal cells leaving them as sort of like a perfect middle on what we understand as the biological trees. And if things can be observed in the modern times heading that direction, then potentially a way, way long time back, things from one tree jumped over to the other. Or the idea that all of biology itself is slowly going towards that perfect middle or perfect creature. Also, there were a bunch of like old middle-aged legends of like trees that like just made babies or like these bushes and cabbages that made like goats and stuff so that's related i guess sky snag theory is saying that ufos are the pure result of a chemical reaction in the air essentially whenever two conflicting air waves hit each other at great speeds or they're sort of a crosswind the friction that's produced between them along with the trace particles in them starts to form essentially a snowball that keeps expanding that sort of aluminum sphere that's created seems to be a ufo to us but is actually an accumulation of whatever trace metals or other particles are floating around in the sky this is saying not only are ufos just objects in the air but can also be induced by government so if they want to encourage a ufo sighting in some place all you got to do is release a bunch of trace elements into the air make the air streams go together which we've well established at this point in the iceberg the government controls the weather and then boom you've got a ufo that would also explain the perfect shape because the sphere is created because they're like perfectly adding the atoms wherever they seem fit and that's why it's a circle also every single video describing this or like animation describing it is really creepy and unsettling and i'll let you find that for yourself I, that is your homework have fun with that Veltislayer, which stands for world of ice or world in ice something like that is also known as glacial cosmogony it was an idea brought forward by hans horvinger 
Herbinger, Herbinger, whatever, in the early 19th century as an idea of the existence of humanity. The story is really long, but short version is one night he was looking at the moon and realized that the iridescence of it is exactly that of ice. And then after having a dream in which he was shown the cosmos and how ice broke apart and formed everything as we know it, he came to the idea that the base root of everything in the known universe was ice. Essentially, the theory says that trace amounts of hydrogen went through the air and then they froze in the depths of space and created ice and then those were broken apart and that's what led to modern life. And water and life and oxygen and everything like that comes from melted or different versions of ice itself. This also relates to really old world ideas that on every side of the earth were essentially these giant ice walls, which is actually a theory that's still put forward by some flat earth believers that around every corner of the earth are these giant walls of ice that hold in the barriers of what we know, or essentially the reason the world may be expanding is because it's melting outwards. Also several old stories like a Norse mythology talked about giants beyond the ice wall. That's not related to this, I just had to mention that. And also these ideas of the Veltus layer led to a lot of the German research that happened in World War II into theories like the occult and all of that, so that's something cosmic censorship cottage i'm convinced is a typo and i know that nothing else on here has been a typo and that doesn't make sense but you also got to realize this iceberg was made by one person and you also got to realize i spent like a day searching everywhere on the internet all of my resources for where cosmic censorship cottage goes together and it's nowhere however there is a very known thing called the cosmic censorship conjecture which I'm gonna retcon here and say that's what he meant. Cause cottage for one doesn't make sense here. There's a term that would fit on this iceberg that has a very closely related word or at least spelling related there. And I have no idea how cottage could tie into this at all. So it's conjecture now, just saying that now. The cosmic censorship conjecture is an idea that relates to things like black holes. So in the realm of physics, there are several things that we get to known as singularities. These are points where either gravity reaches an infinite point or mass reaches an infinite point or whatever. The reason black holes are a big example of that is because gravity goes to such a point that mass's weight goes to a near infinite. So every time that we get to one of these singularities, something really weird happens. That's where the idea of like E equals MC square and other ideas that Einstein came up with come from. The idea that if you reach a theoretical infinite in energy, you can do really wonky things like travel through time, or I should say a near infinite speed, but whatever same thing basically it's like there's these hard walls with our understanding or what we can do in physics that we just can't seem to break things like starting a black hole despite our lack of trying with things like the hedron collider or breaking the speed of light however anytime that that happens in our known world anytime that something breaks those rules of physics there's like a weird veil put over it. Like a black hole, right? The reason it's called a black hole is because it carries such weight that light itself cannot escape the pool, which is a really wild concept to think about, but that doesn't mean nothing's going on there. It doesn't mean it's an empty space. It's just that from our rules of observation, whenever something gets to such a wild point in physics, it's impossible for us to view it. The same with something traveling faster than the speed of light. If something were to do that, we would have no way of seeing that or processing what it's doing. It would simply occur. The cosmic censorship conjecture is that anytime something is allowed to break our rules, we're not allowed to watch it. Now, if you want to get into the idea that that's God, that we're in a simulation and those are like the parameters set by the CPU we're in or whatever other theories you have, it's saying that whenever something does something that we ourselves can't we're not allowed to look at it. This has led some to theorize that maybe if we could see into a black hole, we would see the supernatural or the afterlife or some other really out there concept that we can't really understand. Because there's no specific rules that just because mass gets so heavy, we no longer can see it. It's again, just like a sort of veil draped over our heads. So all of these gaps in our understanding of how the world works may not be accidental, but purposefully put there by someone or something. And that'll do it for tier eight of the Conspiracy Theory Iceberg. Everyone, we have got two tiers to go. 
tier nine is really cool i've looked at some of the terms and it's all like just mind-blowing stuff every single point and then tier 10 is like 14 if that it may be like 12 uh titles and each of them are these huge overarching ideas that i can't wait to talk about and i'm so excited and i hope that you all are excited and i hope you're still enjoying this um i know this has been a long-running series uh, but like I've said before, I would much rather take the time to nerd out and talk in detail about it rather than being like, all right, uh, here's all of tier eight at once and you can go listen to someone else talk about it in detail. Like that's lame. I'd rather just do it myself. Um, and I, I think like at this point you all are on the same page and I really do appreciate that. And I really do appreciate you watching. Um, so thank you all for watching. I hope that you enjoyed I'm trying to think of other announcements. I said at the beginning that I would be putting the um, entire conspiracy series into one video. Um, so that way if anyone wants to go back, they just have a long video that they can just stop and then pick up whenever. Someone's going to listen to that thing in one day. Um, and that's terrifying. <laughs> but uh, thank you all so much. It really does. That guy's going to have like his brain melted. Uh, but thank you all so much for watching and for being here. Um, this has been a wild ride. Um, th there's just like opportunities opening up and people that like I'm talking to now about, I, I don't want to say business even, just like this hobby of mine, YouTube, um, that I never thought I'd even speak to, much less would ask me to help them with their projects. And it's really humbling and it means a lot. And uh, I'm just so happy to be here. And it's thanks to you all. So again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much to all my subscribers. Like I said, 417,000. It's hard to believe. Just thank you all. Uh, thank you so much to my patrons. Thank you to my top tier patrons for supporting me. As always, I couldn't do it without you guys. And it means the most. Um, also, someone asked exactly how long it takes to record. Just, out of cur just so you know, this one was a bit faster because I didn't have as many mess ups and I was kind of on it. It is been exactly an hour and one minute yeah so the full recording of this has been an hour and one minute which is pretty fast for most of these a normal conspiracy episode's like an hour and a half um and i have no idea what the final time would be but you can figure out what parts used and what part isn't um so yeah if you were curious but thank you all so much for watching i hope that you enjoyed and that should be it so thank you all for watching and i will see you in the next one